Hi, I'm Lisa Bien, and welcome to Bouncing Back. I have a story that I suspect will mean something to you. You are not smart enough, pretty enough, or good enough. This was the mantra I created in my head and words I live by for most of my life. Can you imagine living and believing this mantra every day? It impacted every decision I made throughout my years, from what career to pursue, to my marriages and other personal relationships. Today, after years of struggle, pain, and priceless therapy, I continue to fight those words and live the truth, that I am smart, pretty, and good enough. It's my goal to teach young women and men to stop listening to society's negative messages so they can believe that they are good enough. Being a student at Temple University changed my life. One professor believed in me and it was life-changing. She was my first mentor and career coach and her impact on my life was significant. Today, I'm a communication specialist, an entrepreneur and an adjunct professor here at Temple. My passion is to be a mentor, give back to students who need support, a role model or a person who believes in them. I want to help students realize their potential to believe in who they are. Let's get started right now. Today we will hear a story about bouncing back, reclaiming love, and rekindling self-esteem from a former student of mine at Temple, Anna Tate. Anna began her struggle with an eating disorder when she was 14, though she can recall feeling that she wasn't enough in her early childhood. She remembers her youth as a time of wanting, the perfect grades, the perfect friends, the perfect body. Anna was enchanted by her ability to control her body through food and her flirtations with starvation and dieting provided her. She claims with a sense of power. However, by the time she was 17, Anna had become bulimic and she was entirely consumed by her eating disorder and the pursuit of thinness. Everything she once loved, singing, acting, and participating, engaging with friends at school, all ceased to matter in the shadow of her disorder. Three years of this mental and physical self-violence and turbulence went by before Anna began her recovery. And today, at 24 years old, she has accomplished more than she ever thought possible when she was entrenched in her eating disorder. Now let's hear from Anna. The lens through which I've come to understand my eating disorder and my identity as a woman is one that is steeped in and defined by appetite, a constant wanting a need for more, more, more. I always believed that when people saw me, they saw the opposite of perfection, a walking mass of flaws. And so I found myself always striving for perfection. When I found that I could control and perfect my body by restricting my food intake, it was such an exhilarating phenomenon that I fell in love with it and always wanted more of it, insatiably so. By the time I was 17, the eating disorder behaviors and thoughts had spiraled so far beyond my control that it had entirely consumed my consciousness. All the things I once loved to do, singing, acting, being with friends, participating in school functions, ceased to exist. My eating disorder was all that mattered. Though I'd gone through therapy for my bulimia, once it was over, I felt this sense of freedom that I could finally pursue what I had always wanted, extreme thinness. So when I went away to college, I did just that and dropped 35 pounds in two months. And in being dangerously thin, I felt this corrupted and false sense of power, especially over other women, thinking that my thinness somehow made me better. I was acutely aware during this time that I did not know myself. I was scared of myself. I could not be trusted because I knew I was lying and that I was dangerous. And I really was. I began drinking much more heavily and recklessly. And before I knew it, I was arrested for a DUI a month before my 20th birthday. And that was the night everything clicked into place for me. I knew that if I didn't change, I or someone else could die. A life would be over. It was a huge shock to the system and I knew I would have never been able to forgive myself for that. So I began recovery pretty much the next day with my brother who made me breakfast. I ate every bite. Recovery has not been linear or consistent. 
It's always up and down, back and forth, riddled with relapses and questioning and wondering if it's even worth it. But it is. At 24, I feel more alive, more beautiful, and more like myself, even as I fight for my life against this monster, than I ever did when I was wholly surrendering to it, to anorexia and bulimia, to those thoughts that constantly pushed me to be something else, someone else every single day. And who I am is a woman who loves, feels, and wants to engage, who has a serious appetite for pleasure, success, wonder, and connection, who does not want to exist in the margins of my own life, watching my loved ones live out their truths as they wonder how I lost mine to obsessions. And I further want women to know that they can trust who they are, not what outside messages from peers, media, or even parents tell them to be, but who they are in the purest sense of themselves, which really has absolutely nothing to do with your body. When you trust that woman, you can love her. You can give love to yourself, which in turn helps you give love and share love with others in such a way that it begins to heal your wounds and suppress your demons, which we all have. It's more than okay to be and to love yourself. It's the best thing you can do in this lifetime. So Anna is with us here today in the studio. First, I want to say thank you so much for having the courage and the strength to share your story with our viewers today. I think it's very courageous of you. So really want to say thank you. You know, you say early on and early in your childhood that you realized that you weren't maybe good enough. How early would you say that you, your first memory of that? I would say right around that age where your social awareness and consciousness really begins to kick in, about nine years old, was when a lot of the comparisons started with my peers, with images I saw all over different forms of media. And I just remember thinking, I don't look like that. I can't do that. I'm not enough. Early. Did you ever go and talk to anybody about it? Did you ever feel comfortable talking to your maybe your your friends or your parents about why you felt the, the need to compare yourself with others? Not specifically. I may have expressed an anxiety here or there that probably no one thought was out of the ordinary, um, but I remember not having really the vocabulary to discuss my insecurities and to, to share that, and I, I felt ill-equipped to do so, and I really didn't gain the tools to do so until I went to Renfrew, really, which is a leading eating disorder treatment center right here in Philadelphia, um, and I was 20 at that point. So many years went by without having any idea whatsoever how to communicate these thoughts. Do you think, I think, and, and, and I think that the, everybody struggles with these thoughts of not being enough, but for uh, for some reason, people don't want to talk about it. They don't want to share their insecurities. It's amazing how I don't think anyone's exempt from these kinds of feelings. I really don't. Everybody goes through their life, I think, and feels it at some point. And we are so afraid to show our vulnerabilities and our flaws because we're not perfect. But we do live in a society, in a culture that pushes perfection so hard that when it's time to confront your own demons, your own imperfections. You can't. You don't have the tools. You don't have the example leading you to do so. So you just flounder until you have to scrape yourself up from the bottom of the barrel, it seems. If you could tell the viewers today one thing about, you know, what would your message be if you're struggling with whether it's not being pretty enough or thin enough or smart enough because we're here on a college campus and it's mm. all about getting great grades. It's all about going to the parties and making sure you look beautiful or being on the right sports team. What would be the one takeaway you would want someone listening and watching the show today? What would be the one thing you really like to, to remember about this? I believe that when you strip away everything, all those social effects, all the clothes, the grades, there is a part of you that is unchanging. It stays the same, I believe, from birth till death. And it's so pure and it's so real and it's unchanging. It stays the same throughout your entire life. That is the part of yourself that you have to trust, that you have to nurture, that you have to strengthen. If you can wake up every day and say, today is the first day of the rest of my life. I'm not gonna mess this up. 
I don't want to mess this up. I want to be in love with myself. I want to give the best love I possibly can to myself, which spreads out to so many others once you've got that down. And it's a work in progress at all times. If you can get, tell yourself that every single day, I think you can start to move those mountains and overcome those obstacles that are just looming ahead of you, it seems, at all times. But trust yourself. Trust yourself. Who you are is important. Who you are matters. You're the only person that's you. <laughs> Nobody else can say that. That is a reward in and of itself. You have to live it every single day. Somebody once gave me a great piece of advice when I was going through a really difficult time in my life. They said, go and have a great love affair. And I thought, well, I don't really want to get in, be in a relationship right now. And she said, have the greatest love affair with yourself. Treat yourself like you would treat your best friend. Treat yourself like you would treat somebody that you love because I think that sometimes we forget to love us and being kind to ourselves. No one tells you to do that. We, I mean, we always hear, um, you know, be a good neighbor to thy own neighbor. Uh, we are so steeped in social relations and the intrapersonal versus interpersonal is just as important and it needs to be addressed, I think, at the earliest possible age. We, we don't, we don't tell people to love themselves. We tell them to change yourself, you know, improve this, get skinnier, get in shape, learn a new language. We're told that who we are in and of ourselves needs work. And you don't. I don't think it, and you, don't, you can always change, you can always improve, but there's a part of you that's perfect. It's you. Don't let anybody take that away. Thank you, Anna. You're welcome. <laughs> Anna, thank you for sharing your journey with us. I know you have the strength and the resolve to live a happy and healthy life. Up next, we'll meet a respected mental health professional who has advice for all of us who are bouncing back. Farley is going to share some advice with us about how we can all deal with societal issues that clash. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I You're really welcome. appreciate you taking the time. You're welcome. So, you know, I've been an adjunct here at Temple University for probably seven years now, and I have found that a lot of students come to me with a lot of really deep emotional stories that they want to share, and it's, it's almost like they're reaching out and they want mm -hmm. to, they need somebody to share their story with. What advice would you give, number one, to all the students? And, and, and is this common that, that this age group, that when they're on the college campus, that they realize maybe more that they're under pressure because they're trying to figure out, they're trying to figure out what are they going to be, where are they going to go, where are they going to end up? Absolutely. I mean, this is one of the most profound periods of change in the life of anyone. In fact, in psychology, we've, we're beginning to adopt a term for the roughly 20 to 30 age range of uh, emerging adulthood. <laughs> Not adulthood, but right. emerging adulthood. And so there's emotional issues and cognitive and relationship issues all over the place. So no student at any university should feel that there's something wrong with them in that they have you know, these kinds of issues to deal with. I think one of the really valuable things that, that they should understand is that um, there's uncertainties in life. And actually how you deal with the uncertainties is what strength is all about. You know, personal efficacy and strength and, and, and self-esteem and so on. How do you deal with all of the uncertainties that come at you? Because you can't predict everything, you can't nail everything down. But, it, you know, if, if a student is having serious problems, relationships or things seem to be interfering with their work, their schoolwork, they should probably get some help. And every college campus in America has got some outstanding counselor, counselors and counseling centers. It's interesting because you talk about, you know, we all have to learn how that there's, you know, strength. You have to build your strength. But how do you do that when you feel like you're, you don't even love yourself? Like, 
that's a challenge for a lot of people. You mm -hmm. say, you know, we can sit here and talk about it, you know, build strength. And life is lots of uncertainty, but it's also really scary. And if you don't believe in yourself, it can become daunting. Yes. And um, no one's perfect. And accepting that one is struggling through things. For example, I was a college dropout and and for years, I mean, it took me before I sort of got to where I focused on psychology, <laughs> maybe for obvious reasons. <laughs> you wanted to find yourself. <laughs> I, I think so. Still searching, actually. And so self-understanding is, is very important because that's where your primary strengths lie. So one very valuable thing is sort of reflecting on yourself. What are your strengths? What are your interests? Sometimes it's valuable just make a list. What's at the top of your interest list? And so on. And, and force yourself to think through yourself and what your interests are, what your strengths are. And it's a very valuable lesson in life to play to your strengths. And if you have thought about those and have thought about your interests, then maybe follow those. And, um, and this is a very important lesson in life. Uh, I've studied people of extreme accomplishment all over the world, and one of the things that they have is sort of self-knowledge. Um, and they're motivated to act upon that self-knowledge. So that's a simple formula. Success in life equals self-knowledge and motivation to act upon that self-knowledge. So um, on the topic of, of loving oneself, for example, uh, therapists will often use the phrase unconditional self-acceptance. And um, do you accept who you are? Do you accept your personal qualities? Uh, can you use those to build a life? Um, so it's a very important concept, but going along with that concept is unconditional other acceptance. That is, you can accept others. You know, and often many of our personal problems tend to arise from relationship problems. And so we have difficulty with perceived difficulty with somebody else and their qualities and what they want out of you and what, they, what they're trying to get. And um, so it's a negotiation, you know, life's a negotiation, let's face it. And there's a kind of an equation between loving oneself and loving others. And that equation is so important in life and in happiness. But um, in psychology these days, we emphasize a lot the, the positives. Think positively. The glass is half full, not half empty. Um, uh, be forgiving, but also be giving. Generosity. Uh, thinking of others. And it's amazing how doing that uh, gratitude, forgiving others, and so on, comes home to you. And it makes you feel better. It improves your self-esteem. Uh, so relationships is at the center of it. It's alleged that Albert Einstein was asked, what's the most important th thing in life? And you might have said, understanding the universe. No, it, apparently he said, relationships. So y you can't arrive at sort of love of oneself in a vacuum. And so it's very important to love others and to be generous and giving and forgiving and show gratitude, uh, play to your interests, your main interests and your strengths in life, make decisions based upon what you know about yourself. And to get that self-knowledge often requires reflection. You got to think about things. So if you have a failure, think about it. Why, why, did, I, why did I fail? Analyze it. Successful people always do that. To them, failure is just a learning experience. And so if you're struggling with something, whether it's weight issues, body image issues, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, think, reflect on it. Why am, I, why am I, what's the underlying motive? Is it to, that I, I want to be loved by everyone? Or, you know, what? What underlies this problem I'm having? 
And of course, if it gets so that it's interfering seriously with your life, you really need to see a professional. So you were talking about the balance of self-love and love of others. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think people get confused about how much should they love somebody else because they can lose them, they can lose who they are truly mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. loving somebody else who might not be good for them, who are, you know, taking them down a path that they shouldn't go. So how do we know? And you, you know, you talk about reflection. I, I'm a really reflective person. I think every day, how did that conversation go? How could I have made that better? Mm -hmm. And but sometimes I take too much responsibility for it not going well. So how do we strike that balance? Wow, that's one of the big questions of life. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we have. Well, a, you're a very smart man. <laughs> We have a, you know, what, a 40 or 45 percent divorce rate, so it's obviously not working perfectly well. Right. This equation thing. Right. Um, well, uh, or, but wait, is the divorce rate, now the divorce rate could be that people are, are, are quitting quicker these days. You know, my parents stayed, are married, my aunt and uncle are married mm -hmm. 45 years, my, my parents are married 35 years. I think that we live in a society today that it's easier to quit than to work hard. That is true. And actually that gets to this whole issue of the uncertain life. I think the young people today, there seems to be a lot of uncertainty in the air. Uh, for example, the whole workplace has changed so dramatically in the last 10 to 20 years with the whole rise of the e-commerce and, and, and the digital world. And so the, it's an uncertain century, and America has been invaded from the outside, something that nobody believed would ever happen, et cetera. It's interesting that the average age of young people getting married is getting older and older and older. To me, that bespeaks a kind of uncertainty. They just, they're wrestling with a lot. And when we in psychology talk about the 20 to 30 age range is now uh, emerging adulthood, Back when I was in that, in that age, you were, you were considered a full adult by 21 or 22. But today, it, and, and so I think that there's a lot of uncertainty to handle and, um, and risk. And one of the things about Ralph Waldo Emerson, a great American writer once said, always confront the things you are afraid of. And it's a simple recommendation, but coming from such a great mind. Young people sort of need to confront the things that, the uncertainties of their life. And you can't run from it in terms of, you know, booze or sex or all sorts of other things, which, which may be an escape from dealing with the big issues of, you know, becoming an adult, getting good relationships and... And, and, and loving others as well as oneself. So there are huge issues, and I think that um, the, the uncertainties of the 21st century just seem to be kind of exceptionally high. And so we shouldn't be surprised if, if young people are having some trouble with decision-making, uh, you know, making, making decisions about their life, their relationships, their careers, et cetera, et cetera. I think it goes with the century. Dr. Frank Farley, thank you for joining us today on Bouncing Back. We will be right back with more. We heard a lot today about confronting our issues and about overcoming them with continual growth and self-improvement. All of us have the same opportunity to become the best version of ourselves. We live in a nation and a culture where more than ever, we document our lives and we share them through social media. With just the press of a button, we can take pictures and preserve the image of who we are. We can stop, pause, and take a look at what's really going on inside of us What's at our core? A year ago, I decided it was time to see what others saw, that I was pretty. So I started taking self-portraits, commonly known on campus as selfies. Originally, I wanted to simply just look at my face. I needed to see what others saw. But over time, I noticed that I was prettier than the image of myself that I created in my mind. 
So I challenge myself, take one selfie a day to really get to know and be comfortable with who I am. I realized that when I was having a good day, I felt beautiful. And I discovered that my beauty was not about my physical appearance. It's about my passion and my love of life. These special things about me create an energy that is motivating to my family, friends, and students. I invite and challenge you to try this exercise. To take your selfie, take a look both inside and out. Look for your beauty at your core and remember that beauty comes from inside, from love of self, and the firm belief that who you are is enough you and you alone. And remember, especially in the toughest of times, we can all bounce back. Thanks for joining us. I'm Lisa Bien. Goodbye.